Once upon a time, a rising singer-songwriter went back to his hometown to visit his family for the holidays, and he ran into an ex-girlfriend at a convenience store. As the two tried to reconnect, they couldn't reach beyond the deep chasm of emptiness that existed. So he turned that pain into one of the most bittersweet story songs of the 1980s. Find out the real story next, beyond the poetic licenses that all artists take, and celebrate one of the purest voices of the rock and roll era with a great interview coming up next. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever got in a fight with your brothers and sisters or your friends about what radio station or album to listen to in the car next, you know, when you were growing up, you're going to dig this channel. Make sure to press the subscribe button below right now. Click the bell so that you don't miss out on our daily content. Make sure to check out our new merch. Our new Vintage Years collection are available below. You know, Christmas music is uh, very polarizing. Santa baby, just slip a sable under the tree. You know, some love it, some hate it. They detest it. Everyone has an opinion about it. Well, my favorite Christmas song of all time really isn't a Christmas song per se. At least not a traditional one. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. But in my definition, it transcends the holidays and gets straight to the deepest of human emotions that only great music can really evoke. It comes from one of the rock era's purest and most angelic voices. He is one of the most realistic songwriters ever. Talking about Dan Fogelberg and his classic 1981 top 10 hit. Uh, he released it in 80, but hit its peak position in early 81. I'm talking about Same Old Lang Syne. My lover in the grocery store. Today we're going to go in-depth on that classic song, and we also have an interview with one of Dan Fogelberg's foremost musical collaborators, legendary producer Norbert Putt Putnam. Sadly, Dan passed away at just 56 years of age from cancer. He has left a musical legacy that will last forever. Dan Fogelberg was born in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, he's the youngest of three sons born to musical parents. Mother Margaret was a classically trained pianist, and his father Lawrence Peter Fogelberg, who uh, Dan affectionately covered in uh, the exquisite top 10 hit, The Leader of the Band. Legacy to the leader of the band. He was, in fact, a band director at Woodruff High School in Peoria, at Pekin Community High School in Pekin, and uh, at Bradley University in Peoria. So Dan immediately gravitated toward music. Uh, he taught himself how to play the guitar, and he used a, a Mel Bay course book, I believe. He also learned to play the, the slide guitar that his grandfather had given him, and uh, he also played the piano. When he was just 14 years old, he joined a band called The Clan which uh, they just mostly covered Beatle tunes. And then he was in another band called The Coachman. And in 1967, they released a single with both sides written by Dan Fogelberg. Now, after he graduated from high school, he studied theater arts and painting at the University of Illinois, while at the same time playing uh, live music with a folk rock band. So from there, he started uh, gigging as a solo acoustic artist around town, where he was discovered by now music mogul, the great Irving Azoff. Azoff sent him to Nashville, you know, to hone his craft. And uh, I spoke with his first producer and frequent collaborator, Norbert Putnam, about this uh, very thing. Here's what he said about it. Young Dan came down to Quadraphonic Studio, and he came up the steps, and behind him was Irving Azoff. And Irving's got REO Speedwagon, and he's got Dan Fogelberg, I think he's about to get Joe Walsh if he doesn't have him. And he's about to move to California to become a big-time <laughs> big time manager. And Irving said, well, you know, we have to fly to California and see Jim Messina. He said, uh, uh, we will let you know something in the next week or so. And then and they were gone within an hour, I guess. And I sort of thought, well, I'm not getting this gig. But about uh, two weeks later, Irving called me and said, uh, We've notified Clive that we'd like you to do the record. Great, I said. <laughs> I mean, I thought this is like getting a male Joni Mitchell. Dead love from both sides now, from give and wait to say no to the morning. 
And so then he comes down and he starts to play songs for me. I said, so how many songs do you have? Well, I only have 10. He lied to me from the very beginning. He had the first three albums written. And so when I, when I busted him on it on the second album or the third album, he said, well, I realized that the only way I'd ever get these songs recorded would be if you never heard everything. And I said, well, why did you want to work with me anyway if you're going to lie to me? <laughs> he, said, he said, do you remember writing a song that was in an area code 615 album? Oh, yeah, I only wrote one song. He goes, that's one of the greatest chord progressions I've ever heard. I just wanted to work with a guy who wrote that. <laughs> that's how we began. <laughs> so his debut, Home Free, came out in 1972. He had his first hit, Part of the Plan, uh, from his Joe Walsh-produced 1974 album, Souvenirs. By the mid-70s, you know, Dan Fogelberg was well on his way to becoming one of the great American troubadours of that era. In the early winter in 1975, Dan Fogelberg returned to his parents' home in Peoria to celebrate Christmas, uh, actually Christmas Eve, with his family. So they wanted to make Irish coffees, but they didn't have any whipping cream. So Dan volunteered to run to the store to get some. Well, it just so happened that Dan's high school girlfriend, a woman named Jill Anderson, had also returned home to visit family. Uh, at the request of her mother, she went to the store to get some eggnog. Well, as fate would have it, uh, and also because there were not many stores open on Christmas Eve, they both ended up at uh, the same local convenience store at the exact same time. And the first sparks of a great American standard started to fly. My own lover in the grocery store. The snow was so the story really happened blow by blow that Fogelberg captured in this classic song. He starts out by saying, I met my old lover in the grocery store. The snow was falling Christmas Eve. I stood behind her in the frozen foods and I touched her on the sleeve. So he recognizes her immediately. And then after he gets her attention, he says, she didn't recognize my face at first, but then her eyes flew open wide. She went to hug me and she spilled her purse and we laughed until we cried. And we laughed until we cried. I have to point out, Dan Fogelberg, he's a master lyricist. I mean, the imagery here, when he says her, her eyes flew open wide and how she goes to embrace him and you know, spills her purse all over, and then they laugh until they cry. That captures every element of encounters that we've all had with ex-lovers or old friends. The awkwardness, the joy, the, the whole thing. But that line where he says, we laughed until we cried, that's the most insightful to me. And we laughed until we cried. It expresses the abutment of uh, Fogelberg's innermost feelings, the joy of this fateful encounter that's completely wrapped in the melancholy wonder of what might have been. This is a theme that he will return to several times in the song, you know, in the chorus and at the climax of the song. So let's continue. So he uh, continues to capture this feeling that we all know so well when he says, we took our groceries to the checkout stand. The food was totaled up and bagged. We stood there lost in our embarrassment as the conversation dragged. As the conversation dragged. Another example of his gift as a writer, he moved the story along explaining exactly what they do, getting your groceries, getting checked out, all while the conversation is stunted by the past and the present trying to figure out how to coincide, how to find that uh, once familiar common ground. We've all felt it. From there, he explains that in order to properly catch up, they try to have a drink or two, but because of the holiday, they can't find an open bar, so they end up uh, buying a six pack at the liquor store, drink it in the car. In real life, though, according to past interviews, the two of them bought a six-pack of Olympia at uh, that convenience store. 
And then Dan rather sadly opines, we drank a toast to innocence, we drank a toast to now. We tried to reach beyond the emptiness, but neither one knew how. But neither one knew how. This perhaps speaks to the fact that in the past they were lovers, but with so much time having passed, they just aren't able to reconnect in the present uh, under new circumstances. And then comes the unspoken truths. As she explains that she had married an architect and he kept her warm and safe and dry. Kept her warm and safe and dry. And how she would have liked to say she loved the man, but she didn't like to lie. But she did not to lie. This sounds like she's telling all about her spouse and her life, but Dan Fogelberg can read between the lines that the man is able to do everything for her monetarily, but there's no passion or love in the context of the words where she's describing her husband. I said the years have been a friend to her. Now, diving a little deeper into this, in an interview, the woman behind the song, Jill Anderson, now Jill Grulich, has said that she actually heard the song, Samuel Lang Syne, on the radio about five years after her encounter with Dan. She said she saw me in the record store. She was completely astonished. She was driving along and she heard this new song come on the radio and uh, she recognized a familiar voice. It was Dan. As she listened, she was like, that really happened. That's us. My old lover in the grocery store. So a few years after the song was a hit, she apparently saw Dan Fogelberg in concert and talked with him backstage uh, either before or after the show. And they discussed the song for the first time and the poetic licenses that he had taken with the song, including calling uh, the convenience store a grocery store and uh, changing her eye color from green to blue. And this is just like as Paul Simon explained to Dick Cavett about why he used Joe DiMaggio and instead of Mickey Mantle and Mrs. Robinson. It's all about syllables. Well, this time it was all about rhyming. Dan said, you know, blue is easier to rhyme than green. But they never did discuss the most introspective line about her marriage. Actually, she had remarried by that time, so there probably wasn't much to discuss. I think he got it. I wonder what her ex-husband thought about that line. Interesting. So Another great lyric, Fogelberg compliments her saying that the years had been a friend to her and that her eyes were still as blue. I said the years had been a friend to her. And at this point, he stops at blue and doesn't explain the rest. That her eyes were still as blue. As onlookers or as listeners, we're left to imagine how he might have finished that sentence, but it doesn't matter because the important part of that line is that he's not sure if she believes him when he says that in those eyes, he isn't sure if he sees doubt or gratitude. Further evidence that though they were once close, they're still not sure how to feel years later. They're still kind of getting past that awkwardness. He's second guessing every word, every glance they both are. We drank a toast now. Then their conversation turns to Fogelberg and she tells him that she knows of his fame as a musician, having seen him in the record stores. She said she saw me in the record stores. Assuming that, you know, he's riding high, but this is where Dan really expresses the reality of his situation, that he loves sharing his music with his audience, you know, with his fans, but being on the road is really taking its toll. And then he repeats the chorus of drinking a toast to their innocence, you know, meaning their past, but it's also a toast to their present lives. We drank a toast to innocence. We Dan's lyrics are just the perfect juxtaposition of the conflict throughout this entire ordeal and the conflict we all have when we run into an ex trying to find that solid ground to stand on, to be able to, to talk with one another. And then he repeats the chorus, changing the last two lines and delivering the power of the song. Reliving in our eloquence. And what he first called a pun, he says, reliving in our eloquence. 
another Auld Lang Syne. Referring to the old expression that will be forthcoming as they're really a week away from New Year's Eve. Now, the words Auld Lang Syne literally mean old long since. Though in practice, it means old times, especially times that are remembered fondly as well as an older long friendship. It's actually from the Scots language, having been first recorded uh, somewhere between 1660 and 1680. Now from here, Dan explains that it's time to go, sharing that the beer was empty and her tongues were tired, They're running out of things to say. Beer was empty and her tongues were tired. Again, he's capturing the familiar anxiety or the awkwardness of a conversation uh, with someone we haven't seen in years that has become stilled and we are left a little bit helpless, unsure of what to say, how to reconnect in a meaningful way. As they begin their departure, Dan says, she gave a kiss to me and I got out and I watched her drive away. And I watched her drive away. Now this is where the song is set in stone, is one of the most poignant and nostalgic works in the great American songbook. As she departs, Dan looks and sings, just for a moment, I was back at school and felt that old familiar pain. And as I turned to make my way back home, the snow turned in to rain. Snow turned in to rain. Everyone who has ever heard this song and truly listened to these lyrics knows that that old familiar pain, all too well. That aching, throbbing, potent emotion called nostalgia. Old familiar pain. Feeling so gut-wrenching, it just knocks the air out of you. It cuts you off at the knees and creates a, a hard and painful lump in your throat. As he turns to go home, the snow is transformed into tears. Rain. I mean, snow on Christmas, it's always beautiful, always an elegant sight. But as it changes, and he contrasts with the sad drizzle of rain, Fogelberg lets us as listeners into his fragile depiction of youthful longing and aching wistfulness. It's one of popular music's truly breathtaking moments. Perfect balance of joy and sorrow. Watching her leave, it's as if he's uh, had the realization that his youth is lost forever, closing that chapter of that book in his life. He turns to go back home, he begins a new chapter, and we hear the, the melancholy notes of the phenomenal Michael Brecker saxophone solo. He begins playing Auld Lang Syne, and we don't even have to hear the words because the song is so familiar to us just like his old familiar pain. Should old acquaintances be forgot? What a brilliant touch by Dan Fogelberg here, because Auld Lang Syne, I mean, the song is so reflective. It's really about two friends catching up over a drink. A friendship or a relationship once close, now long distant, hence the word acquaintance. Now, the idea came to Fogelberg when he was experimenting with Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture, changing the arrangement. You know, making it uh, more like a pop as a way to entertain some friends. But he took the joke up a notch as an interesting challenge in musical invention. Exercising his craft, he created the song title, sort of a pun. Now, in an interview once did, he said, suddenly I realized there was a great poignancy developing in the song that I never intended. It started taking on a life of its own. I never intended it to see the light of day. I want to go to more of the Norbert Putnam interview here where he can give more insight into Dan Fogelberg as a musician. And actually the first time that Dan showed this song to his producer friend. That was going to be on Phoenix. I think he was engaged to Maggie, who later became his wife. And one night he came in, he said, I don't want to put the old Lang Zion on this record. I said, why? I thought it was, that was my idea for our single off Phoenix, okay, it was old Lang Zion. And any of the records, it would have been my choice, all right? And he said, she just doesn't want me to be singing about an old girlfriend right now. 
So <laughs> I thought that would be the biggest hit he ever had. By the way, the street in Peoria where Dan met his old lover on that fateful Christmas Eve is now named Fogelberg Parkway. The reason the same old Lang Syne is such a, a beloved American classic is apparent in the title. It's same old. It's old hat. It's an experience we can all wholly relate to. I have my story, you have yours, which you should share in the comments below for sure. I mean, I remember running into my ex-wife when I hadn't seen her in over a decade. Although that particular experience had more of a Garth Brooks unanswered prayers. And I ran into my old high school flame. Or Chicago, if she would have been faithful, ring to it. But you understand, we've all had an experience like that. This song is so universally relatable. In fact, in an interview, the woman that Dan wrote the song about, Jill, she said, what I have observed about this memory is how many people can relate to that meaning. She ended with saying, it's a memory that I cherish and one that all of us cherish too. Every single holiday season, both the song and the beautiful sincerity and the pure voice behind it. Dan Fogelberg. <laughs> Make sure to leave us a comment about this breathtaking song. Share your same old Lang Syne experience below. Your feelings on the great damn Fogelberg. What are some other great holiday classics that you love? If you like this episode, make sure to check out our companion piece, another one on damn Fogelberg. We'll link to that below. And make sure to subscribe below so you never miss out on our videos. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Check out our merch. Check us out on Patreon. Until next time, three chords and the truth.